Um, I'm Jan. Um, I'm from Switzerland and I actually discovered uh, New Zealand fly fishing about eight years ago. I um, used to work for a bank in Switzerland and then I had a sabbatical for about uh, 12 months and I travelled the world and I started fly fishing here in New Zealand and fell in love with it and I came back every year since then, it's almost a decade ago and uh, back home I have a, a family, I have a wife, a wonderful wife that lets me go fishing every year for a month. A <laughs> <That helps. laughs> uh, small son, he's uh, one and a half years old and my whole family lives in Bern and I'm also based in Bern, Switzerland. I was always keen in fishing. I fished since I was a little boy, but there was more worm fishing in the river or go for pikes with like a, a big lure and a big fishing rod. And then when I approached New Zealand, I knew I, gonna, I want to stay here for like two to three months. And then I just looked it up, how do you fish in New Zealand? And everybody told me you have to fly fish. So I, I went to a fly fishing store in Christchurch and just bought a rod and just started to try it. And it took me a while and then, until I got my first fish. But then the whole visual aspect just, uh, you know, just I loved it. And then I, I just started to fish and I fished almost three months. It took me about six weeks to catch the first fish and since then I'm hooked. I mean, fly fishing in New Zealand is not just fly fishing. I always say it's a combination between backcountry, outdoors, hiking and fishing. And then you have those small streams, crystal clear water and big fish. And so it's more a hunting, hiking, fishing trip. And that's what I love. I, I would never just go to a lodge and fish out of the lodge every day and, you know, fancy four by four cars and going back home and have a steak. I really love to be out there in the wild. And, and, and fish my way through a valley and New Zealand you can explore so many rivers and you have so many different options you have high country you have back country you have low country and you always find good fish in, in, in clear water and I just love that because you see the reaction of the fish you, you have to approach the fish and you if you do a mistake you know why or you just you see the reaction the reaction of a fish is always honest it's not if you have a good loop or if you try to have a good approach that the fish says, you know, no, uh, he can catch me. Of course, I, I love to catch big fish, but I mean, if I just wanted to catch big fish in New Zealand, I can also go to the canals. And, but just, you know, the, the whole exploring, you know, to put on the backpack, you know that you're going to be away for five, six days. You just hike up a valley and you just do exploring. And that drives me in combination of catching the fish, big fish, of course. But it's just, it's the whole experience to be out there. To, you never know what's around the corner and suddenly you start to see fish. And that's the visual thing. I mean, I fished all over the world and mostly there are big rivers you can't see and you just... Sometimes you see a rise and you just, you know, you just cast away until the water is foaming. And here in New Zealand, you really have to find them. And you, then we, when you see them, then that excites me. Yeah. So it's a visual aspect. It's all about the visual aspect. Because it's not, it's always, I always say, it's not just fishing. It's like first finding them, it's more hunting. You really, really target the fish you want to catch. And that's the, the adventure. A second really big fish dropped in quick succession brings Jan to his knees. That's fishing, I mean, you know, my wife always says oh, it's, uh, it's, it's called fishing and not catching, so uh, I mean, it's also good if you sometimes miss a fish or if you have, you know, an unlucky day, it's like it's charged up your, your battery to get a fish, so it's also good. If we would catch every fish, it would not be funny. I mean, that's also the visual aspect. I mean, if you cast to a fish, you see the reaction of the fish. And you can tell if the fish is spooked. I mean, if he swims away, then he's, he's spooked anyways. But if you see that he's still feeding and he's looking at your fly and maybe you don't have the right drift, you don't have the right fly. But I mean, if you analyze the fish, you can tell so much what the fish is doing. And as long as he is feeding and he is not spooked and the tail is down and he's all stiff in the water, you still have to try. and, and that was a good example. I changed the flies, 
I did a lot of tasks, but suddenly he took the fly and I hooked him. And a lot of people just, you know, try one or two tasks and they just walk away. But if the fish is still feeding and not scooped, it's still catchable. It takes Jan a while to subdue the fish, but as soon as he wraps his hand around its big tail, it quickly becomes apparent why. Much like Leif, Jan's first fish of the trip is a trophy brown over the 10 pound mark. It's a very dark coloured and thick set fish taken from very heavy water. Yeah, the next morning we had a, a decent start. I think life was uh, casting to a fish uh, and you were with him on the other side. And I was watching you guys and then I just had a look upstream and I saw a beautiful fish uh, just cruising in a really, really small pocket. Although there is a feeding fish on our side, Jan insists he has a big fish lined up. So we follow the action, hoping to come back to ours later. Fighting a large brown in heavy water dictates you anticipate what the fish will do and try to stay as close as possible and in control should they run hard downstream. Jan's prize from choosing to cross to the far bank is another superbly conditioned trophy fish of ten and a half pounds. Uh, <laughs> mate. Good that's, fish. I'd say that's two doubles in uh, two days. Two days, yeah. yeah. Beautiful fish. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's really yeah. clean. Yeah, he's, he's Bring him out, show us. Nice good old lift, bring him out here. The first fish of the day. Well done, mate. Okay. Okay, we let him go, huh? Seen him on his way. Yep. Yeah. Cheers. Woo! That was a good start. 
Well done. Hello. Next. It's nine o'clock. We still have some uh, hours ahead of us. Yeah, indeed. As we admire Jan's fish resting after the battle, we quietly contemplate what is always a special moment in the life of an angler, a sight-fished trophy trout. Our minds then slowly drift upstream, visualising the water ahead and the prospect of being attached to another large New Zealand brown trout. We don't have to wait too long for more action as a prospecting cast from Yarn sees a cicada dry fly engulfed by another wonderful brown. I was lucky. Blind fish to cicada. Yeah, while waiting for the others. Yeah, and lifting him up. And he came way. up, and that boy was on. There it is. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful fish. fish mate. Yep. Yeah. So I think we let him go after that intensive yeah. fight. Day's not over yet. Yeah, in a non-mouse year, it's just a normal year. Um, they, they feed normally. They, they do what is dictated by the food source, you know, which is a lot of small nymphs, caddis mayflies, occasionally midges, stoneflies, and. You know, if you're lucky enough, they'll get up on top, and that can be a day-to-day -day thing. You know, it's not a seasonal thing, like a lot of other countries. But they'll, they'll get up on dries if you're lucky. You know, and and um, we normally cover them with a dry if there's any chance of that. But you get a mouse year, and uh, the game changes. In that, after a month or two, from what I've seen over the years, anyway, they stop really eating much else after a couple of months. So I think they finally recognise mice as a constant food source now and they don't really need to take risks on other stuff. Because I believe, apart from very small dark stuff, most flies, artificial flies, are taken out of, that might be food, curiosity, rather than, I know that's food. And so, if the fish don't have to take risks, then they only take really small stuff. And so the only way, if they've stopped really feeding, is to basically put a tiny fly right on their nose. And sometimes, instead of, it's, it's more work for them to get out of the way than it is to just open their mouth and eat it. So the, the feeding changes a lot. And um, you wait for the right times to fish to them. And they'll, if you watch their patterns, they'll start to feed more in the evenings, where, it's, where they sort of feel a bit more relaxed. And you've also got to sort of really put a lot of thought into fly selection. And I, I was using a fly specifically, I thought, they wouldn't have seen much of, and it's and there are a lot in that drift. It's a particular type of swimming mayfly, so quite hard to imitate. And that's what we have most of our luck on for the whole trip. To add to that, when you have a mouse year and then you have a lot of bad weather, that bad weather, either a really cold front or a lot of rain, or both, um, can knock the, the mouse populations right back, and almost overnight, you know, can cut them by 80%. And then if the mice aren't hitting the rivers at night, crossing to find more food, the fish are looking up, not finding them anymore. And so, within a, usually within a week, 
they've decided, well, we need to keep feeding to maintain our big bulk. So this year we've seen, because of lots of bad weather, we've seen patches of these big mouse fish actually even eating dries occasionally, which is just, you know, I mean, that's the angler's dream. An enormous New Zealand brown trout, well over double figures, eating small dries on the surface. After landing a big brown early, losing this one to a pulled dry brings me back to earth with a resounding thud. Soon enough though, I'm stalking in on another brown that has just moved into position in front of a large submerged rock. I'm using two small heavily weighted nymphs with a long fine leader and watching the trout for any subtle signs of a take. Yep, there it is. Although it's another superb brownie, it's still shy of the 10 pound mark we've set as a trip benchmark. Yeah, it's a stunning fish. And while I'm wrapped with this capture, I'm left with the feeling of unfinished business. We look at the back on that. That's what they've been like this year. Stunning. stunning. <laughs> well, I actually don't fish by myself much anymore. Oh, I used to a lot um, when I was younger. I guess age, you know, tempers everything, you know, and it, and it also tempered my need to go out constantly and challenge myself. So now I, I fish for the camaraderie, and of course to catch some nice fish, don't get me wrong, but I think finding someone like-minded with the same, same passion and the same philosophy on fly fishing is, you know, so, so important. And so yeah, it's the camaraderie of that, you know, Chinwag about everything you can think of um, outside of fishing. So yeah, I, I fish for different reasons these days, but I am still driven to get out and fish a lot um, because I love the whole thing. When my turn rolls around again, it looks to be a smaller fish, but as it's feeding well in a good spot, it takes little coaxing for me to step up for a shot. A dry dropper rig looks to be the money on this one. Half the size of the bloody last few, and it's um, what not more of a scrap. Gone down a pretty thin string too to um, to try and get the take. So I'm on five pound there. Probably a bit 
fatter than I thought. Make you, um, you two glory boys feel a bit better. Um, get a, a normal looking fish that which fought harder than any of the fish did. But he's um, absolutely beautiful fish. You can't complain about that, although it sounded like I was. It's a lovely six pound brown there trout, but it's go. a great fish anywhere, and the fight was next level. So I'm Off more than go, happy fella. as I prepare to send it home. Right between the cameraman's legs. Oh, shot. <laughs> That's a release. <laughs> oh, well, um, I love catching fish. It'd be nice to get a bigger one, but um, there's only, I think, uh, a limited number to go around, and you guys have been nailing them all. I think the most yeah. satisfaction, you know, on achievement was, was that one that I had to go at. I'd prick three f big fish in a row and they'd all come off and every time, I, you know, using just a single or double nymph rig, really long 22 foot leader, no indicator, and watching the fish and they'd swing and they'd straighten and I'd, I'd lift into them and they'd prick and off. I think they've become masters at dumping the fly very quickly because of the amount of pressure on them. I've just glanced downstream to check any potential snags, shot a hook, what looks again to be a very big fish. I've tied on a terrestrial pattern in case he might be tempted up, before going to nymphs if he shows no interest in the dry. That was the look of a fisherman who thinks he may have run out of chances. And I can really feel the pressure building. He's refused the cicada pattern, so I'm searching for just the right nymph to replace the dry. I'm also taking time to recheck the tippet to ensure there are no nicks or scratches. A quick run through my fingers does the trick. I'm creeping forward as close as I dare to ensure the best drift and also to be able to see any subtle signs of a tape as I'm not using any sort of indicator. And um, to get that one, it literally just on his left and he barely moved and I saw the girls flare and I just lifted and he bolted off. Took off up three sets of rapids, stumbling around on rocks, he was in pockets, he was in caves, he was trying to do everything up there. This big brown tried to find every rock and every hole on the river, taking me up into the heavy pocket water, and I was aware the whole time that if he ran hard, I'd have to be quick to follow. Finally, when he did decide to go down, he almost had me in the backing very quickly. Go, 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 go. And uh, 
it, it took a lot to just keep up with him. And my actual mouth went dry, completely dry, because I knew he was a nice fish. He had big, big neck and shoulders on him. Then suddenly he started to run down and that was the moment I was a little bit scared that you're going to lose him because I, I knew it was a big fish and you had like almost your whole fly line up and had your hand up and the fish just swam down like hell and uh, then you slided him into a really small pocket in quite fast water you had a lot of pressure on your rod and then you tailed him because life was also running behind you well that's almost 200 meters uh, a man scrambling it well, I hooked him and he took off head shake went out to the side back and then he bought up three sets of rabbits climbing ridiculous white water I'm into white water up to here I felt him rubbing on a rock at one stage he was down in the cave I had to lever him out so um, camera, that, was a, that was a mission <laughs> well to get him in and I was pretty relieved when I got him in. But the, so that was the most satisfaction, the most relief. But the, the colour and the shape and the weight of that fish, you know, was just so memorable. And he was absolutely gorgeous. You know, I think he's around 13 pound. And I've caught some similar size this year. But that was the most memorable one of the season, I think. Beautiful fish. You guys are banking doubles and you hung in there with me this afternoon and I really appreciate that. Um, because, I mean, that is absolutely sick. Huge. Um, words escaped me for once. That is unbelievable. Okay guys, thanks again. Off he goes. You know when you have that fight when your mouth and lungs go dry? And I just <laughs> sort of flick water in as I was going. That's crazy. I never thought I was going to get him until I got him into the slack water here. And I'd left you guys about 100 metres behind. <laughs> At <a> least. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. As the sun threatens to dip below the hills, it was time for us to head back to camp, with Leif sadly leaving us to head home. Myself and Jan have a big drive ahead to get to a new spot tomorrow, but we wander in that languid, unhurried way that comes with the satisfaction of success against the odds. Fresh boot prints, gusting winds and huge educated trout conspired to make success elusive for long periods. But as we bask in the last of the sun's warming rays, I'm struck by the feeling of not really wanting to leave a valley, but while challenging, it ultimately allowed each of us to sample some of its greatest treasures. And that's something no one can put a price on.